very excited about today's lecture, more so than normally, because we get to talk about something that uh, fuses what we've learned in this class uh, in a way that's very ecologically valid. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the psychology of gambling. And so there's a lot that goes into this, and to do it proper justice in 50 minutes is hard. But we will certainly skim the surface today and sort of uncover some really important social, uh, cognitive, and biological mechanisms uh, that underlie risky, impulsive behavior, and in this context, gambling. And I think what you'll see is that they apply in such a way to also look at other forms of addiction, uh, sex uh, addiction, uh, drug addiction, alcohol addiction. What you'll find is that many of the mechanisms that are true in gambling are, al are also true in other forms of addiction. And so what I want to do is to start out talking a little bit about why are we talking about gambling. And then we'll proceed into uh, the various mechanisms at a couple of different levels. And so I want to first start with the idea that gambling for much of its history has been compartmentalized. And what I mean by that is that there's been a certain set of places where gambling is acceptable. Other places often do not allow it. Uh, even looking at uh, Las Vegas, Las Vegas has a history of sin. And it's been less than 100 years now where gambling has been acceptable. And certainly the culture has changed quite significantly. You might have heard of Monaco uh, in France, really fancy casinos, the Monte Carlo Bay Casino being one of them, very fancy, high class caliber, really everything being five stars. Uh, you've probably heard of Atlantic City. Uh, Atlantic City, uh, just by New York, is uh, sort of the Las Vegas of the East. It has uh, many of the same sort of luxuries, including gambling, that you might find in Las Vegas. And at the time, that was the East Coast way in the United States to keep people on that side of the country, not to have them fly out to Las Vegas. Why go to Vegas when you can go to Atlantic City? Certainly, you have the Las Vegas Strip. How many people have been to Las Vegas? Show of hands. Wow. Wow, good. 60, 70 percent, I can see, out of 200 people. Uh, Las Vegas, a lot of fun. I, I think one of the things that you'll notice about Las Vegas is that there's nowhere like it in the world. And that means a lot of different things. This place is open 24 hours a day. It has some of the most incredible architecture that you'll ever see. We'll look into that just a little bit. You can gamble 24 hours a day. And not only can you gamble, but you can gamble your life savings away. One story you might have heard of a couple years ago is that a man in England, he uh, was kind of fed up with his life. And so he sold everything that he owned, took every possession that he had, had about $70,000. One-way flight to Las Vegas and bet it all in roulette. Bet it all on a color, he bet it on red. And you think about it, this is a big decision to make, right? If you win, awesome, you double your value. If you lose, well, let's not think about that. He won, and it changed his life. Las Vegas can change your life. <laughs> Who's heard of Macau? Show of hands. Less hands, but still a significant number, about 50% of the class. Macau is a uh, state-approved republic of China. Uh, in Macau, you have a strip as well that rivals the Las Vegas Strip. It certainly rivals it in terms of revenue, because after this year, Macau makes more money than Las Vegas. This is the new mecca of gambling, the Las Vegas of Asia. Quite interesting. Makes more money, and it's undergoing massive development, the Kotai Strip. More and more casinos, many of the same ones that own casinos here, are taking advantage of this incredible opportunity. It's a booming industry. There's an incredible amount of money to be made. Right? It's certainly portrayed in films as well. And you've seen it in a number of different contexts. You've probably seen it in James Bond, where gambling huge amounts of money in poker is a very sexy, risky thing to do. He's betting millions of dollars as if it's nothing. Uh, most of us would argue that that's more than nothing. But for him, it's a game, and he uh, fights terrorism with it, at least in the context of Casino Royale. Perhaps you've seen the movie Casino. And Casino is a really interesting movie. Uh, it talks about some of the dark sides of, of casinos and gambling. But the way that they view people that gamble is what I want to take note of. Robert De Niro, in this case, he's the casino manager. He talks about how stupid people are for gambling, that they spend all of this money to travel to Las Vegas, they dump all their money out, and they leave broke. It's almost as if gambling uh, is a really stupid thing to do for people. That being said, a lot of people still do it. Is that a fair thing to say? Bachelor Party Las Vegas, oftentimes places like Las Vegas or Reno or places uh, 
like that are viewed as places that you can go and party and have fun and do whatever you want. And somehow when you leave that place, everything that you did, however bad it is, is somehow you're absolved from it and you can go back and lead your normal life. Right? You have Vegas Vacation. I showed a uh, brief clip uh, before class started. This is a really interesting one because Chevy Chase in here, the context of the movie, he has a bit of a gambling problem. He loses $26,000. He includes uh, cashing in his uh, flights for the way home. His family clearly perturbed. But somehow, some way, it all comes together and he grabs a winning Kino ticket from a man who pretends to die and he gets all the money back. And all of a sudden, gambling is viewed in a very positive way. That you can just like that change your luck. You can be down on luck. Things may not be working, but one good bet changes it all. Right, you see it in the context of the movie 21. Many of you probably saw this movie where a group of MIT students, this happened in real life, uh, practiced strategies at blackjack which are known to reduce the house advantage and they made millions of dollars. They were eventually caught and they got into trouble, but it was viewed as a way that you could beat the system and you could make exorbitant amounts of money. In this case, Ben made enough to go to Harvard Medical School for four years, uh, $300,000. In real life, he earned much more. Quite interesting. Easy money, right? Right. You have uh, The Hangover, of course, in the upper right. Really interesting. You know the premise of that movie. They need $80,000 to get their friend, and so they sort of simulate what happened in the movie Rain Man, where Rain Man was a savant. Uh, we know our, our little buddy there uh, pretended to be Rain Man, took his skills, and all of a sudden made $80,000 in like an hour. And then he's good to go. Easy money, right? And then you get the realistic side. Vegas is an amazing, beautiful thing to many people. It's also a very dark and sad and scary thing. Documentaries like this one, Las Vegas, uh, an American experience, looks at how amazing Las Vegas is and how it makes you feel and what it does to people's psyches. But it's, it also talks about the dark side, how it's ruined people's lives. And so it gives perhaps a more balanced view of gambling. And perhaps my favorite quote, I know all of you have heard this, even if you haven't been to Vegas. You've seen this commercial, you've heard it from a friend. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You can go to Vegas and be another person. The moral boundaries are stretched. And one of the ways that you can apply that is with gambling. Certainly other things are possible in Nevada. Now the idea with this is that gambling at first was more compartmentalized. But the idea has changed in that gambling is more and more available. Right? Even driving up here from San Francisco when, when I moved up here for my job, what I noticed is, is that the density of casinos increased sharply, especially as you enter Washington, to where you could throw a stone and hit a casino, go to that casino, throw another stone, and hit another one. They seem to be everywhere. And certainly that's true in British Columbia as well. There's a number of casinos. I'm sure you've seen River Rock. Perhaps you've been to it. Uh, there's actually a SkyTrain stop at River Rock in case you don't have a car so you can still get there. Beautiful. Right? You have Edgewater Casino in downtown Vancouver, so in between the games, you know, you're watching the Canucks game, you can go down, blow a few hundred bucks, come back, have a great time, right? Also true in Washington. Just a few miles south of the border, when you cross into Washington, you have Silver Reef Casino. As you continue to go down, they, there's plenty of fancy opportunities uh, to make decisions however you like. Now, I have a personal connection with gambling. Gambling is the reason why I couldn't go to college at 18 years old. Uh, my father is and was a pathological gambler, and he gambled away my college fund. And I got into UC Davis, and there was no money for me to go. And so gambling in that sense was also what got me into college, because I worked in a casino for a year. And I worked about 60 hours a week, and I made enough money to go to college for three years of working at a casino for a year as a blackjack dealer, and later as a blackjack supervisor. Extremely interesting, unique uh, life experience. I would love to talk about it in more detail, but suffice to say, I think there's societal reasons for looking at gambling, but certainly uh, there's personal reasons as well. And they certainly differ for different people. When you look at the effect in Canada, it's amazing. In terms of gambling revenue, it's increased multiple times over. So if you look from 1992 to 2008, gambling revenues in billions have increased just over two to over 14 billion. And this is looking at Canada as a whole over this time period. And if you break it down by province, well, British Columbia does its fair share. Right? If you look in gambling profits in 2008, 
$1.1 billion a year. And the government, because gambling is regulated, the government gets a chunk of that. And so it's a highly profitable business. Canada and other places in the world. Here's the thing. Not only is there a casino down the street from you, but there's also one in your computer. Right? And you see this commercial. How many people have seen this commercial from playnow.com? If you watch TV, you see it. You can't help but see it, especially at night. Right? You see this, wow, this is so fun. Look at these sexy people with all of this money. And you can sign up and get $100, and you could win you know, $50 million, and blah, 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 blah. It's really amazing. There's incredible opportunities here. You don't even have to leave your house to gamble anymore. You can play whatever game you want. Location and traveling is no longer a restriction on this behavior. And because of that, many, many more people are gambling. It doesn't have to be a bad thing, but in some cases, it can be quite destructive. And the goal of today is to talk about some of the mechanisms by which people start gambling, but also, more importantly, the mechanisms by which they continue gambling, despite even heavy losses, both personally and financially. What are some of these mechanisms? There's quite a few, right? So at any given casino, uh, MGM Grand, for example, has a player's club. It's called M Life. If you join this exclusive club, you get perks. Perhaps you get money back for, for gambling a certain amount. You get discounted, if not free, dinners, show tickets, hotel rooms, so on and so forth. And so like credit cards do when they give you a certain amount back for purchase, gaming institutions will give you a certain amount back. Uh, they call them comps, complimentary sort of perks, uh, that are given to reward you for your play. The longer you play and the more money you play with, the more you earn. Much like when you have a credit card, the more you use it, the more rewards you might get, depending on what you're using. This is interesting because it's one of those things that people think about when they lose. They go, well, I may have lost $1,000, but I got to see that show with Celine Dion, with my wife and I, and we got to have an amazing dinner. The value of that may be a few hundred dollars. The cash loss, certainly more. But this is something that people often look to when they lose money. Say, well, it could have been worse. At least I got this out of it. You feel like you're earning something even if you lose money. And if you win money, you still earn stuff. And so it's even better. It's a mechanism to earn even though you may not be earning on the tables. Look at this approach motivation. This is uh, the casino Aria. How many people have been to Aria? Show of hands. Uh, just a handful. This is part of the new center called City Center in Las Vegas. Uh, the casino outside looks like this. It's absolutely modern, absolutely beautiful. And this is a view of the inside of the casino. And you'll bring your attention to a couple things. One is you see that the casino curves. This is the main floor, and it walks around this way. The casino curves for a reason. It occurs because they don't want you to walk into the hotel and have seen everything. They want you to go in, to explore. Because the longer you spend in a casino, the higher the chance it is that they can make money off of you. By buying food, seeing shows, certainly gambling. Right? We know that many casino games are stacked in the favor of the house, some more than others. The longer you play, the longer you stand to lose. And so they want to create an environment that makes you feel welcome, that makes you feel powerful, that makes you want to be there. Because if you don't want to be here, no money can be made. The lighting is a certain way. Oftentimes you see the tables are structured around bars or where young people congregate. Right? It's informational influence. Right? Other people are gambling, having a good time. Boy, that looks fun. I should do it too. They create a culture that makes you feel powerful. And perhaps you've gambled before. Perhaps you've made a little bit of money. Perhaps you've got a taste of that power, right? Where you know more about the game, so it seems, where you have lots of money, where you have more power. It feels good. Casinos create a culture to cultivate that. It's no accident whatsoever. Right? Certainly when you walk in and you see people play, as you do here, you see lots of people playing different games. You see machines going on. You know, we're social creatures. We look to other people on, for cues on how to behave. And if some guy's got a big stack of money or some gal in front of her, they're playing and they're having a good time, 
lot of people think, and rightfully so, boy, that looks fun. I should do that too. Maybe I could cough up 20 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever. Whatever I can manage, right? To be in with the in crowd. If other people are doing it and having fun, why shouldn't I? Let's create a culture that broods this idea. And casinos are extremely effective at this, right? You know, in casinos back in the day, they used to pipe in sounds to make it sound like more coins were falling, right? Because it would make it sound like more people are winning all at once. You think, gosh, you know, Jack over there and Joey over there are winning money. I could be too. And this is the interesting thought, right? By not gambling, I'm actually losing money because I could be making money. Right? Really powerful form of logic change. Let's talk about some of the cognitive features. I think this is the one that's most striking. That money doesn't quite mean the same thing in a casino. And you might think, well, of course it does. You're playing with money. Well, casinos are quite smart. It's an amazingly smart structure. So if you go to a table game, such as blackjack, and you want to play, let's say you have $100. They don't let you put the $100 on the table to gamble. Rather, you change the $100 into chips. Maybe it's these colorful chips from the Flamingo that are worth $5 each, and you get 20 of those. OK, that's well and good. Slot machines do the same thing. I put my $100 bill into the machine. And if it's a $5 machine, I have 20 credits. I have tokens, or I have credits. It's no longer money. You might think, well, you know, people are very smart. They still know that that's money. I agree. People still know that chips are money. But the value of the chips seems to have changed. And I love this quote. During gambling, money loses its economic value. It doesn't disappear, but it certainly changes. Put another way, I know that $20 of chips is more than $10 of chips. I know that $20 cash can buy a t-shirt. But $20 in chips and the relationship to the t-shirt gets distorted. Now in college, I don't know if you use a metric like this. In college, I used to rank things in terms of burritos. I used to, it's a true story. Uh, I loved Chipotle, and back in the day, you could get a delicious burrito for $5. And so $20 would buy four burritos. And so I'm thinking, well, I could buy that desk for $100, but that's 20 burritos. That's how I would calculate things. A little strange, but for me it worked math-wise. <laughs> right? My calculation, arguably, from, from, if this logic follows, of $100 here doesn't equal that number of burritos in quite the same way. Right? Perhaps this explains why when someone has uh, a pot of chips, they're more likely to just push them in. Right? They'd be far less likely to do that to take a bunch of money bunch of wads of bills and to shove it in the circle. But chips are smaller, a lot easier to do that. It's a $100 chip. I've seen $25,000 chips at Bellagio. I've seen the $100,000 chip. And it's a very nice looking chip, don't get me wrong. But all of a sudden, that huge exorbitant amount of money, piles of cash, is now a chip. That distorts our view of what that really means. Maybe you've seen Casino Royale, uh, the James Bond movie, where they have the half million dollar tiles. The real big money, they're tiles, right? Again, it's the same idea. Money changes into a different object, and that different object somehow means that it's worth less than it actually is. Interesting. One of the most prominent things you see in gambling is an illusion of control, and more specifically, it's this, that people believe they can control events that they can't, right? Back in the day, this uh, was uh, a problem for some unfortunate blackjack dealers. So uh, the term dumping comes from dealers, and it basically says this. Uh, when I'm dealing, and I'm losing all the time, and I'm paying all the players, I'm dumping. I'm dumping all of my money onto the players. And of course, that's a wonderful thing if you're a player, uh, less exciting, perhaps, if you're a casino. And back in the day, dealers who were dumping or losing a lot were actually fired. And this makes absolutely no sense because the dealer can't control what cards come out of that little shoe. But the bosses still laid the blame and they lost their jobs. One real world example. It's really interesting. How many people play Yahtzee? Anybody? Anybody play craps or anything with dice? Just a handful, right? Well, my mom plays Yahtzee. I love my mom to death. And what she does when she needs sixes, she shakes them like this and whoosh, blows on them, shakes on them, maybe rubs them against the cat. 
and then throws them, as if doing any of those things are actually going to influence the outcome. But it's the funny thing, right? Because when my mom does this goofy thing, and she rubs it against the cat, and she rolls and gets a six, she thinks, yeah, it works, right? You're making that link, even though there's no causality there, that the goofy behaviors don't necessarily affect the outcome, you can believe that they do. And so this affects people in the real world when they're gambling, if, they're, uh, if they have the special role, if they're feeling lucky, they're more likely to bet more. Right? If another person has rolled a few times and they seem less lucky, the person will bet less. And so based on these things that have absolutely no bearing to the outcome, people change their betting behavior. Right? One of the interesting things here, though, is even in a coin tossing game, when people flip a coin and guess whether it's heads or tails, if you get the first few right, even if you're not a gambler, you're much more likely to attribute this to skill. That is, that you're good at guessing which coin, which coin side was going to pop up. In the real world, this applies to slot machines. If you win a couple times in the beginning, you're more likely to think, yeah, I picked the right machine. I'm, I'm good at this, right? Slot machines are my thing. Even though that has little, nothing to do with the outcome. And this is especially true in pathological gamblers. That is, when good events happen, they're most likely to say, well, it's because I'm a skilled player. I have experience. I've been down this road before. When something bad happens, they're very likely to say, ah, it's just bad luck. Not my fault. And so they really focus on the positive aspects, really discount the negative ones. And so that negative learning, it doesn't affect anything nearly to the degree it should. Right. We talked about the gambler's fallacy. In roulette, it's actually quite common. So black has come up eight times, and someone might be very likely to think, wow, I should bet on red. Because if black and red are 50-50, red's got to be coming up. And we make that fallacy, and many times we lose. We use probability poorly. But I think even more notable, the superstitious behavior. I used to work in the morning sometimes with the graveyard shifts. And I would often be sitting at a table with no customers. And so like many people, I would watch others. And I would watch people do the goofiest stuff around slot machines. And these, these are all true stories. One person, before she pulled the reel, would go like this, like a waterfall, <laughs> and then pull. And the funniest one yet, true story, a uh, young girl, she must have been 19 or 20. She had a cowgirl hat on. And what she would do before she spun is she would go like this and then press the button. And I thoroughly enjoyed watching this. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, wow, why? I was 18 years old at the time. Why would she think that uh, the lasso behavior actually affects uh, the outcome? And I was still at the table. There was nobody there. And she comes walking by, and she had a big smile on her face. And I said, excuse me. I, I said, I was just curious as to your superstitious behavior. I, I, did something in the past happen to help you with that? And she said, yeah, as a matter of fact. I think she may have been put off a bit. I didn't mean to insult her. She said, last time I was here, I did that, and I won $1,500. And I said, fair enough. And I said, well, OK. I said, do you, do you really believe that the lasso behavior led to you winning? And she said, no, maybe not, but it doesn't hurt. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, but it doesn't help either. And it kind of looks goofy, <laughs> right? That being said, it's true. I didn't say that to her. She was having a great day. Who am I to, to, to ruin it? But it was very real to her. And I'm sure the next time she went to the Jackson Rancheria, she did the same thing. Right? Very strongly reinforced behavior. $1,500 is a lot to win. And so if you think you can do anything to contribute to that happening again, why wouldn't you? However goofy. Coincidental conditioning is what we call it. Back to behaviorism, you're reinforced at a random time, and she just happened to be reinforced when she was doing this lasso for luck. That's what I called it. And she continued to do it in the future. She saw an association that perhaps wasn't there. What about biased evaluations? We got to this a bit in the past. And so this is often the process of discounting losses, making as little deal of losses as possible while really focusing on the wins. And so for example, great example of this, uh, with poker. Poker is a big deal. When I was over in Italy, the only station that was in English was poker, and it was on 24 hours a day. So I watched a lot of poker. It was interesting. And this Kata guy, uh, he won in 2008, I believe. 
Uh, he won $10 million for win winning the World Series of Poker. I was thinking, wow, that's an amazing amount of money. I would love to win $10 million, wouldn't you? I was thinking, well, when you look at that, he's one person. And think about how many people lost. Thousands of people lost. But somehow, some way, we place greater weight on the good event and less weight on the you know, not so good other people lost event. Interesting how we do that. And so when you ask people who regularly gamble to think out loud while they're gambling, you see this exact pattern. When they win, they attribute to, well, that was a good play I made. Boy, that was just some sharp thinking. When they lose, they're likely to say, ah, it was just bad luck, that was impossible, no big deal. It's much easier to discount bad luck than it is bad play. Interesting. The downside of optimism, I was reading this paper and it was just really, really interesting. Optimists are more likely to continue betting longer than they probably should because they often have this belief that, well, it's eventually going to work out. The problem with that, money-wise, is how deep do you have to go? Right? There's no accident that when you go into a casino, there are ATMs. You can cash your payroll check at the cashier station. You can go up and get money out of your credit card with a cash advance. Perhaps you've seen those machines before with the little phone where you call your credit card company, you say, yeah, I really do want to pull out this money, and they give it to you. Interesting. How deep do you have to go? Pathological gamblers will go deep. Thousands deep, many thousands deep. They could lose their house, so on and so forth. I've seen it happen. Optimism, I'm not saying don't be an optimist, let me clarify. I'm just saying it can be a dangerous thing when applied to certain topics. Sometimes you gotta know when to quit. Okay. The, near, the near miss is my favorite. Perhaps you've experienced this before. Maybe you have a big bet on blackjack and you have a 13, and you say, hit me, and you get a 9, and you just barely lose. You're really close to 21. Or maybe you're at a slot machine. You're at the Wheel of Fortune slot machine. This happened to my wife. She was playing. It was amazing. So you get a 7, a 7, and then blank. Oh, you're so close, right? Because you had two 7s. It's really interesting. We call these near misses, where you're very close to winning, but maybe one little thing is off. Here's the thing about that. Uh, casinos and slot machine makers know that these are really reinforcing things. And so they design slot machines that come up with disproportionately high numbers of near misses. And the reason for that is that a near miss is just as reinforcing on your behavior as actually winning. Well, what's the key difference there? Winning. You don't actually win any money when there's a near miss, right? And so by having lots of near misses, it induces something really powerful that we call cognitive regret. And you think, you know, my wife had the seven, seven, blank. And you can't help but think, what if it was a third seven? What if I won $2,000? Wouldn't that be awesome? You feel bad. You were so close, right? The only way to feel better after something like that is to keep playing and to chase it down, right? And indeed, that's what we do. And even more powerfully, after a near miss, people bet more. In blackjack, in slots, they will bet more. Because maybe they think, you hear this all the time with slot machines. The slot machine's heating up. Right? Have you heard that before? It's getting hot. My time is coming. Got a few laughs, because maybe you've heard of that. That's the kind of thinking. And so you up your betting. The problem with that, the more you bet, the more you can lose. Certainly the more you can win, but also the more you can lose. Okay? Really, really interesting. So what about in the brain? So we have a well-documented pleasure center in the brain. This pleasure center is sort of in the midbrain. We'll just call it the midbrain. And this part of the brain lights up or activates when you're feeling something pleasurable, when something good is happening in effect. Now here's the thing, you can do research in rats. Early research showed that if you stimulate this part of the brain in a rat, the rat feels amazing. Moreover, you can actually put an electrode in the rat's brain and hook it up to this lever. And when you push the lever, you activate this part of the brain. 
rats will push this lever. And they'll push this lever often at the expense of food and other vital necessities. Some rats will push this lever until they die because they refuse to eat or do other life-saving behaviors. Isn't it interesting how it kind of looks like a slot machine? <laughs> Does that at all strike you? You know, this, this observation, it's a really funny one, comes from B.F. Skinner, a behaviorist. And he said, well, listen, you know, people are gambling because they've been reinforced in the past. They've won in the past. It's felt good. And so they play in the future to obtain similar outcomes. Not at all surprising. Really interesting, though, how the rat, how the slot machine behavior looks quite the same. And this is what I want to argue. Perhaps understanding this area of the brain and other related areas of the brain is the key to not only understanding gambling behavior, but even addiction more broadly. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, substance dependence, alcohol, drugs, sex addiction, so on and so forth. Now in Canada alone, one to two percent of Canadians have a gambling addiction. They would be considered by the APA as pathological gamblers. It's about 600,000 people. In the states, estimates are even higher, depending on the estimates that you look at, upwards of 5%, if not more. And so you're looking at 15 million people. And this is something that affects a lot of people. You go to Nevada, and you go into gas stations, they have slot machines. You go into grocery stores, they have slot machines. They're everywhere. You go to the airport, and there are slot machines. You open up the slot machine, and there's another slot machine. <laughs> They're everywhere. Availabil <laughs> Availability is not the issue. And so this creates a unique challenge, right? You think about people who seek out reward. We all seek out reward, things that feel good. If gambling and winning money is something that you particularly enjoy, it's really hard to resist that in an environment where it's everywhere. You can't fill up a tank of gas without seeing a slot machine. And the sounds that they make, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, sounds like that, and, and coins falling. It's everywhere. So what happens in the brain? It's really interesting. So we have video games. You know, maybe they come on the, the Nintendo Wii. Maybe they come in another form, a handheld game. And you can play blackjack or poker or whatever game you like, and you can play for points. And the goal of the game is to win as many points as you can. Uh, this is also real in casinos where you can play those same games, electronic form, video poker, video blackjack, whatever, but you're actually playing for real money. And so what happens when you image the brain of people who are pathological gamblers and you compare it when they're winning points versus winning actual money? What you find is when they're winning actual money, this reward center is on fire. Very, very active. Much, much more active than a non-pathological gambler. The brain's response to these monetary opportunities is vigorous. And perhaps that's associated with cravings, those, those sort of desires to gamble, those obsessive thoughts. I can't help. I, what if I could go out and win money? That strong brain response could explain a lot. Really interesting here, um, negative correlation between the degree to which you're a pathological gambler and your brain activation here. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the task. Very, very simple task. You have two stacks of cards. You pick from one of the stacks, and it's either red or black. And your job is to guess, is it red or black? It's kind of like flipping a coin and guessing whether it's head or tails, heads or tails, right? You can uh, do this on the computer, and you can create a program that makes people right every so often and incorrect every so often. And so you can compare trials when they're correct and when they're incorrect. Right? What you see in control subjects, people who are not pathological gamblers. So you see really strong activation in the reward center that we just mentioned. But also these frontal areas, these orbital frontal areas. Now we talked about this a little bit in the, earlier in the course, that the orbital frontal cortex helps code value. And so if I have a delicious cupcake in front of me, or a Dr. Pepper, I can look at activity in, these front, in the frontal lobes, and it will predict with relative certainty 
which one I will pick before I even move. And so perhaps this involvement is thinking quite a bit about the value of the outcome. Thinking about, I might win this much. Really strongly focusing on that. People who are pathological gamblers, far less activation. And the less activation you have in these reward centers, the more likely you are to be a serious pathological gambler. And so what does that mean? Maybe pathological gamblers need more stimulation to get proper activation of this reward circuitry. Right? And so betting five or ten bucks, oh, that's good and all, and you can win five or ten bucks, but what if you bet 50? What if you bet 100? What if you bet 6,000? I remember seeing, uh, as I told you guys the other day in class, I remember seeing a guy that came up to me when I was playing roulette. He put $6,000 on red because the last six shows were black. Uh, he lost, and he walked away as if it was no big deal. I didn't lose that money, and I had a strong emotional reaction. I wanted to vomit. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that someone cared so little about money. But for him, he walks straight up to another table, pulls out another chunk, and wins it back. Or doesn't. Really, really interesting. Maybe they need that extra stimulation. Maybe that, that explains why they bet so much and play so often. It's amazing, when you work in a casino, you can't help but notice human behavior. One of the things that I noticed that I was absolutely appalled with is that some people would wear Depends diapers to where they didn't have to get up from their machine or their lucky table. And you might think that is absolutely crazy. People do it, right? And it's one of those things, it only has to happen once, right? Maybe this has happened to you. You're playing on a machine for an hour and you lose your money. And you move to the next one, some guy waltzes up, puts $1 in there, and wins $1,000. And you're thinking, ah, I can't believe it. I got if I had played a little bit longer, right? And so to avoid uh, having to get up by, you know, those annoying things like eating and using the restroom, things like that, people will wear diapers and play for 36 hours. Wasn't it all uncommon at the casino that I worked at? I would see the same people every weekend. They would come on in, and they'd stay for 72 hours. They'd be there when I got there. They'd be there when I left. They'd be there the next day, not staying in the hotel, playing the whole time, playing as long as they could, taking all the money they could to play. The busiest time for a casino in the month is when? Beginning, middle, or end? It's the beginning of the month. That's when people get paid. That's when welfare checks go out. It's really troubling. Here's the thing, guys, that I want to focus on. Gambling doesn't have to be a terrible thing. Just as the brochures that casinos often provide, you have to know your limits. You bring 50 bucks. If you lose 50 bucks, be done with it. Hang your head and go home. The problem is people don't stop at that point. They keep going. What if? What if? That feeling of power, that feeling of being in the in crowd, that possibility, what if I win? You think about these machines, these Wheel of Fortune machines, where the jackpots are 200,000, 300,000, if not more. That's a very sexy thing to think about. What if I won that? It would change my life. Las Vegas was built on this principle, the what if principle. Right? It's not likely, but what if it happened? It happens to people, and that's why casinos often have their wall of winners. That Jackie over here from Tennessee won 700,000. They personalize it. Your name could be next. Why not? Give it a try. And so that was the idea behind creating this course that I'd like to do in the next year. There's lots of different things we can look at. And really today, we only scratch the surface. You can look at the social influence that start, but also perpetuate gambling. You can look at the cognitive mechanisms that distort this realistic perception, this bias to enjoy the wins and savor and relish in them, but also to discount the losses and to be in that phase as little as possible. To look at reward and addiction, and it's sure enough, if you look at the literature, many of these different addictions same, share the same neural architecture. How many people would say that they're addicted to their smartphone? Show of hands. Right? I know I was. I'll take one for the team. I had an iPhone in Berkeley. I love iPhones. It was amazing. I get probably 50 to 100 emails a day. 
And if you have your iPhone set up for email, uh, it can be the kind of thing that's so convenient. It could also be the thing that drives you completely batty. And I found for me that I was checking it every 10 seconds, right? Because I'd usually get an email every 10 seconds. But more often than that, I'd need to react to it. I'd want to answer emails. I'd want to be good about it. We often put ourselves in situations where addiction is, is possible, if not likely. For me, I don't even have a cell phone anymore. I may sound like a caveman, but for me, it was great for my mental health. I could change the situation for what it's worth. And to look at casino strategy, again, this is getting into to neuroeconomics, neuromarketing. How can you create situations that make people feel good, that make people feel powerful, that make people want to spend money? Amazing field. A lot of people go into this direction. Whether you go into gambling or another industry, I think the same principles apply. And a lot of high-powered companies, Hershey's, uh, so on and so forth, hire people like this to study what others will find most appealing. You can look in the brain. You can look at the level of behavior. And to explore past, present, and future treatment options for this addiction and other addictions as well. Again, this is something that affects a couple percent of Canadians. You can imagine that number is going to increase. What can we do about it? And hopefully this will evolve into a Psych 207 uh, either next year or the year after uh, should people have sufficient interest. Uh, questions? Yeah? There's a number of things you can do and it depends on your therapeutic approach. Uh, you can give people drugs to reduce impulsivity. And so that, that sort of feeling that, oh, I want to go gamble right now, maybe something could suppress that feeling a bit. Also, cognitive therapy, right? You can change the way people think about the situation. Take a step back and realize that the way that you think about winning and losing, and whether you have skill or not in these situations, is not exactly lining up with reality. And so you can restructure the way that they think. Behavioral therapy, you can punish gambling behavior and reward more uh, positive behavior. And so depending on the therapeutic approach, you might go in one direction or another. Yeah? Um, okay, so just so everybody heard that, wow. Um, so this is a man who knew he had a pathological gambling problem, who asked the casino to put him on a no-gamble list. He came in, gambled anyways, and he's suing the casino for letting him gamble. I'll just leave it at that. Other questions? Okay, thank you guys.